welcome to Money Reimagined. I'm Michael Casey. In recent episodes, we've been on a bit of a world tour of places where crypto is rising as an alternative to broken financial systems or global payment challenges. Well, it's about time that tour made its way to Nigeria, which in many respects has become the poster child of the value proposition for crypto in the developing world. Today's episode dives into why that's the case and looks at the outlook for cryptocurrency and what is something of a fraught relationship between a vibrant crypto community and the authorities there. Nigeria was beset with financial crises early on in the COVID-19 panic as oil revenues collapsed and a global dollar shortage meant that the US currency, which many Nigerians depend upon, became in short supply. That only further depleted confidence in the local currency, the Naira, and it plunged in value, fostering inflation. As a result, there was a surge of demand for Bitcoin and later the dollar-denominated stablecoins. The international dollar shortage was ultimately resolved, courtesy of the Federal Reserve's moves to pump trillions of greenbacks into the global economy, and the oil market recovered somewhat. Yet Nigeria's troubles continued, as did interest in cryptocurrencies. Protests erupted nationwide over police brutality, a movement that morphed into an all-out challenge to the government of Mahamudu Buhari. And some of the activists in that movement started using crypto as a means of payment to move money around without attracting attention from the authorities. And then as the price of Bitcoin soared worldwide and more Nigerians were drawn to it, the central bank took the drastic measure of ordering financial institutions to shut down accounts associated with cryptocurrency trading. Or did it? Last month, Deputy Governor Central Bank of Nigeria, Adamu Lamtek, declared that it had not banned cryptocurrencies. Either way, there is a great deal of uncertainty around the technology status in Nigeria, and a cat and mouse game continues between those who support it and those who want to shut it down. Yet, Either despite or because of this legal wrangling, Nigeria has quickly become home to a vibrant ecosystem of crypto innovation, taking something of a leading role, reinventing money systems to address financial inclusion and other challenges. To get the latest on this and an outlook for the future of crypto in Nigeria, we are joined by two people with deep knowledge of the situation on the ground. Yele Badamosi is the CEO of Bundle Africa, a crypto payments app, and Adia Soho, is a venture builder and operator. Before we talk to Yele and Adia, let's say hello to my co-host, Sheila Warren. Hi, Sheila. Hey, Michael. So I was just thinking, you know, this is, there's a bit of a theme here, a bit of a thesis. Uh, you know, we've been on this world tour, as I said, and a little, whoops, there we go, I'm back. Uh, a little while ago, you know, we talked to Santi Siri about Argentina, which has had this, as we talked about, very you know, re repeated crises and all sorts of challenges financially, and how, at the same time, there is this truly vibrant ecosystem of innovation. Um, I'm, I'm excited to talk to our guest today because that, that really appears to be a similar story uh, of what's happening in Nigeria right now. For many reasons, not the least of which is that Nigeria is the most populated African nation. And so uh, there's a tremendous opportunity. It's its own market, the way that kind of India is or even China is in, in ways that I think a lot of the world population doesn't realize. And certainly the crises that have besieged uh, Nigeria during this time uh, reflect on kind of a history of um, reasons why financial innovation really landed in Nigeria. So I'm really eager to get that historical perspective as well from our guest today and kind of what has been fueled by this current moment. Absolutely. So why don't we turn to them uh, and get them in here? So uh, first of all, Yele, to you, welcome. Uh, first of all, just tell us a little bit about what Bundle Africa is all about. And, and from that perspective, as somebody who is actually engaging with people using crypto, what are you seeing on the ground in terms of demand and, and you know, over this past year? What, what, what has been the growth story? What does it look like? Yes, so um, Bundle is a social payments app for cash and crypto. Um, we make it easy for Africans, mainly in Nigeria and Ghana, to um, buy and sell crypto, um, store their crypto assets, and send it to each other as if it's cash, right? Um, and we launched the product a year ago, actually. So one year, um, April 23rd last year, and we've seen tremendous growth. Um, we have over 200,000 um, users on the platform and, you know, growing quite remarkably. Um, and I think like that just comes down to the sheer demand um, and desire for people to have alternative currencies um, outside of, you know, their 
um, Naira or, or, or Ghana CDs. Um, and I mean, I can go into so much more detail in this, but I think that we are just at the beginning of, of the potential of what the future of crypto will be in, in, in not just Nigeria, but across the African continent. And then Adi, I'd love to hear the same from you. I mean, just thinking through your path and your career and your work, but also maybe you can help frame for us, like is Nigeria indicative of what's happening more broadly in Sub-Saharan Africa specifically, or what might be different about the Nigerian context that enables both of you to engage in the work that you do? Uh, thanks, Sheila. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I have built a bunch of platform companies in the Nigerian market. I'm currently building an agriculture financing one. Prior to this role, I built out and got to a million plus users, an instant credit platform called Migo. And before that, I worked at a telco uh, trying to bring the telco's resources to bear for uh, startups. So basically the telco's data, the telco's access to customers and distribution and so on and so forth. Um, so it's tough to try to build a platform business without figuring out how value moves from point A to point B. So inevitably, I've, I'm come, I've come at this money conversation from a bunch of different angles. So uh, with respect to uh, Nigeria, where we're at now, could you just repeat the second part of your question? Sorry. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if there are things that make Nigeria unique beyond that it can kind of create its own market. But is it indicative of where things are in sub-Saharan Africa, or is it really quite far ahead from the rest of where that part of the continent is? Okay, so with respect to Nigeria, I've, I've never found Nigeria to be an easy country to proxy for anything. Um, but I will <laughs> say that what's happening here can possibly be linked to countries that have uh, one or more of these additional problems. So you have uh, a middle class that is you know, not the right size for the size of the country when compared with developed markets. You have a society that is maybe plus 50% uh, cashless. You have uh, a low trust environment. So perhaps the legal or law enforcement inf infrastructure is um, questionable, maybe not up to par, right? So, so you can't really enforce contract law. Uh, so so that's, those are just three things that I think um, are all um, at an extreme gravity in Nigeria, but maybe to a lesser degree in other countries. Um, coupled with the population, I think all of that kind of drives the innovation and interest in um, faster ways of doing things, exchanging value, doing business um, in a low trust, low infrastructure environment. Mm. I'll, I'll take it then. Um, Yele, so can you talk to us a little bit about, given that frame that we've just gotten here from Adia, um, where are you seeing the kinds of uses that people are uh, are applying to crypto right now? I mean, where where yeah. does the with all of that framing, all of these challenges, where does it lead to? Yeah. So I think like when I take a step back, try to understand what do we use crypto for in Nigeria, um, I tend to put it into between two to three buckets. Um, maybe I might be four, but the first one really surprises a lot of people, right? Which is speculation. So the thing that you hear about is, you know, it's about financial inclusion or it's about remittances or it's about inflation. But actually, you have to understand that some additional context to what Adia said earlier was number one, you have a very young population that is increasingly digitally native that are also not employed or not having access to jobs right and so they have like some amount of money and it's like what do i do with my money now you also have like these same people who are connected to some of the well-known startups in the in the country like carry wise piggy vests that allow you to save your naira and earn an interest but that interest is maybe about eight to ten percent a year at best in naira it's not very easy for you to invest in the local stock markets. And you hear about this thing called Bitcoin that has gone up, you know, in the last number of years. And you learn about other different crypto assets and you're like, you see your friends who are doing this thing and they're saying it's not that difficult and you want to get started. So for the yeah, last like, yeah, just, just, just one moment, what is the inflation rate currently in, in, uh, Nigeria. So I think the last report I read was for February, and I think it was probably around, I think it was about 16 to 18%. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, so even, um, even, the point is to, just to frame it, even at 8% from those naira based accounts, you're behind. You know, right. Yeah. Just wanted to put that in context. All right. Carry on. Exactly. Sorry to interrupt. No, ex exactly right. And I think when you actually look at some items like, like for food, where 60% of most people's money goes into, it's around 24%. So it's even worse for like daily essentials, right? So for a lot of people, crypto is not just, it's not even about speculation. It's like a way of life is how to make money, right? And this is a legitimate way for you to make money. If you can learn about things, you can read about things because Nigerians are just naturally curious. You put a, you put a Nigerian person in an environment where they can figure out how to make money, they're going to figure that out. So that is, for me, the biggest draw. Then you now have, I'll say, the middle class, which are aware of maybe when they travel to the US about five years ago, the rate was maybe 300 and something naira to $1. Then the next year, it's you know 420 to $1. And the next year, it's 500 to $1. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sorry just to jump in so i've worked mm -hmm. in Africa now, uh, and i've been earning in local currency for the last 10 12 years and in 10 years i am probably earning the same if not less in dollar terms so 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 i'm asking myself existential questions here yeah. like what mm -hmm. have i done with the last 10 years of my life right mm -hmm. yeah so you're, you're I mean, there, like, kind of watching this currency you know like you're in quicksand I mean, like, Sorry. like my my, my mom talks about the fact that when she was going to university, it was one one, one pound was one dollar, right? And the price of a car then was like five hundred to six hundred naira. You, you mean one naira was one dollar to one dollar in the right, so one one yeah like one naira to one one dollar one of yes. one pound I think it's one one pound. Now you can't even buy like I don't even know like a. a a small pastry for 500 naira, right? And so, I mean, like, in my company, I was thinking about pensions. And I was like, I'm sure by the time we get our pensions out, it'll be worthless. Just because, like, you can't predict where the naira is going to head to. So for, for the middle class and those people who kind of have constant exposure to the dollar, they're like, I don't want to keep my money in, in, in naira. And so those people... I'm more interested in the idea of, of a digital dollar and, and, and a hedge against devaluation and wanting to earn yield on their dollars, right? Um, and then you then have the third segment, which is more around remittances, right? Um, and this gets a lot, of the, a, a lot of the news, but essentially, if you're someone in the US who has family back home or you're in, or, or you're in, the, or you're in, you know, in, in Europe, there is no easy way for you to move value back home, right? And so once we begin to understand crypto, it becomes very easy for you to send money within like less than a minute. It gets delivered to, you know, one of the products um, 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 in, the, in, the, in, you know, in the country and that gets converted to Naira very, very quickly, right? You have to understand that the something that we do also understand about Nigeria is that our payment infrastructure is actually better than a lot of the rest of the world. I remember the first time I went to the US and I was trying to move money and someone was like, oh, you, I, I can't send it to your bank account. I have to download Venmo or I have to use Zelle. Like for me, I was like, wow, like, so you can't just give me your account number and I send that to you immediately, right? So we locally are used to like fast instant payments. And so when you want to use remittance platforms that are expensive, that are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are slow, you know, crypto just seems like a, a better way of doing things and a more natural way of doing things, right? So that's kind of like the third use case. And I think the fourth one is probably the most recent one that was beginning to become more popular before the CBN restrictions, which was businesses who had multinational businesses that had um, dollar debt obligations outside of the country or were operating in different markets needed an easy way, a medium of exchange to move value from A to B. And crypto, as it became bigger, as the, as the market straight up became bigger, it became a natural conduit to move value. So those, those are kind of like the four buckets to which crypto plays a role 
um, not just in Nigeria, but you know, across 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 the continent as well. So let's spend a little time on the central bank policy here. Now, I, I won't ask you to speculate as to why that was engaged in or not engaged in and what the, I, I'd like to understand your understanding of what the policy actually is, regardless of what the official statements on it are. How has it affected uh, the use of crypto, both specifically within the, the work that you both are doing, but also more broadly, or has it at all? <laughs> yeah, Adia, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <Run to go. laughs> all right. So as much as we may love crypto, it does pose an existential threat to central banks, right? So I think even if you come across a central bank that can't verbalize, you know, in an eloquent way, why they don't like it, there, there's a reaction. You're triggering a central bank. So at the end of the day, um, I think a any pushback from a central bank is a very natural response. And we really shouldn't be shocked by it. We really shouldn't, in, in, in my point of view, it, it, from my point of view. I think any incumbent or anybody that is used to being in the center of a story will never be comfortable with suddenly being shoved aside. In, in, in nowhere, nowhere in life does that make sense. So I think we should all just recognize that. And to me, in the conversations that I've been privy to, um, that is the driving, um, the driver of the position of Nigeria's central bank. Now, it may have been articulated with varying degrees of success and elegance, but that's the bottom line, right? Is, is DeFi is a, is a threat to the existing banking system, and Nigeria has done a good job um, of preserving our, our sovereignty in our banking system, right? As well as our ownership of our banking system, um, much better than many other African countries, I might add. So I think that there is definitely a strong interest in preserving sovereignty and ownership, um, and they will do what they can within their power um, whilst they try to understand this new technology. And, and, and I mean, look, if we look at the world, every week, every central bank is changing their position on cryptocurrency. So it's not like the future is clear or anybody knows their their, their position at any point in time. So, so personally, you know, I mean, I get it. I get the resistance, but I also understand that, you know, you can't really um, turn this tide in a different direction. I mean, we're going to digital currencies, whether we like it or not. Yeah, so Yele, how is that, that reality that Adia talks about, and, uh, but also the reality that there's going to be maybe flip-flopping on this from time to time. You don't really know, you know, where things are going to stand. How has that affected the crypto ecosystem or has it at all? Or do people kind of see this the way Adia sees it? Like, oh, this is kind of inevitable. We're going to stay the course regardless. Uh, yeah. And only if there's something like an outright ban that makes it, you know, prosecutable or, or really yeah. dangerous in some way. Right? Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? So, I mean, I think like, funny enough from, the 5th of February, and I think that's a day I'll never forget in my life um, as an operator in the space, right? Um, you know, my my emails, my phones, my Twitter, everything was going crazy and everyone was sending the same image of, you know, the CBN's memo. But as I, you know, spoke to our lawyers, spoke to kind of like our compliance team, I kept saying that it wasn't a ban. Right. So it wasn't a ban and crypto wasn't made illegal, which for me meant that there was hope. Right. And, you know, for the, the immediate reaction for a lot of people was a lot of skepticism. What does this mean? What can you do? What can't you do? How does that impact, you know, um, um, businesses and operators in the space? But I think like very quickly, even within the first couple of hours, like I was I remained confident because. The, the general sentiment was one of bullishness. You know, people were referencing places like China, referencing places like, like, like you know, India, and saying how these ecosystems survived and thrived. And the fact is, even before companies like, like, like Bundle and some of the other players in the space came into the market, Nigerians were always doing crypto, right? Um, and we drew a lot of similarities between crypto and the FX markets. And we, we all felt that crypto was going to survive. You know, as a, as a practitioner in the space, um, obviously there, there are things that 
I think will be better discussed or said in the future, maybe like five years down the line. But I think like for me, my biggest takeaway was this idea of building anti-fragile systems, right? We, we, we got very comfortable with the idea that central banks and, you know, other incumbent financial institutions were being very accepting about the new, right? Um, and we didn't think about, is there a way to do this differently? You know, and this period has actually forced us to rethink that. I mean, when I, when I started Bundle, I was like, Bundle's going to be in 30, 30 African countries by the end of our first year. I didn't know our first year we were in two African countries. And the reason why that was the case was because there was a lack of Pan-African financial payment gateways to actually even connect you know, the crypto ecosystem to the fiat world. And so for us to expand across Africa, we needed these fiat gateways to launch in 30 plus countries and they weren't gonna launch that quickly, right? So we just meant that we could only be in two, in, in, in two countries. Now we've worked on some things which I'm super excited about. You know, one of our products is CashLink. Um, it's essentially a, 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 a fiat gateway that is decentralized and is not dependent on any integrations. And it's the way, you know, Satoshi imagined Bitcoin, right? A peer-to-peer -peer system. We've built a peer-to-peer -peer system that, allow, that works not just in Nigeria, we're launching it in Ghana in, um, you know, in like two weeks. And we're going to Kenya in three weeks and we'll probably begin to launch four to five countries every other week after that. There is no way without this, you know, um, um, the CBN restrictions will have been able to build or think about building anything that allowed us scale that quickly. And what's special about this, you know, what we've built is that it's not limited to Nigeria or any African country. We can launch it in Latin America. We can launch it in, in the Middle East. We can launch it in Southeast Asia, you know, and there's a, there's a saying I love, which I, which I heard recently, it says something like, because the new is unthinkable, we fight about the old, right? And without the CBN restrictions, the entire mindset that we had was we had to do this this way. And now we didn't have a choice but to think about the unthinkable and, and, and the new that we've built is much better than the existing systems. And we are now anti-fragile. For me, you know, when I look back at the 5th of, of, of February, it's no longer like, oh, wow, this happened. It's like, damn, I'm really happy this happened because we're a lot more better off for it. So that's kind of like the mindset across the entire ecosystem in Nigeria. So fascinating. Sorry, I was on, I was on mute. Michael, um, go for it. So I was going to ask a bunch of specific questions about stable coins and your gateways and everything else. And we're going to have to get to that later because I want to keep running with this. Um, as I said at the beginning, you know, I, I, it's not, not the only country that we're seeing this, right? Where there is uh, adversity creates opportunity. It's the classic, you mm. know, crisis opportunity thing. So I was just wondering, maybe Adia, you could also like, like, talk to me a little bit about the community itself, the innovation, the the fintech, the the drivers of this kind of world, and how living in this kind of environment of crisis and political challenge and everything else breeds that innovative verve that that Yelly was talking about. He's talking specifically about the CBN moment. But, I, but it strikes me that this is probably a feature generally of the ecosystem that its creativity emerges out of that adversity. Is that correct? And can you describe that a bit? Yeah. So I, I say, I often say two things, which I'll, I'll share with you. Um, and I, I'll let your audience know ahead of time. Um, the hosts are just meeting me and they don't know how cheeky I can be. So, so just <laughs> As cheeky as you wish. <laughs> no limits. <laughs> Uh, so I often say that Nigerians have more problems before 9 a.m., right? Mm. Most of you have like a month, okay? Before 9 a.m. every blessed day. So, so when you are conditioned in that kind of environment, um, I think your level of preparedness to, to shift mm. and reshift, it, it becomes quite innate, but then I think you get to a next level when you when you when you recognize that and you start to to actually modularize your life in preparedness for something going wrong. You know what mm. I mean? I think that founders are starting to get smarter. I think the our ecosystem is maturing. So there are some 
I mean, the first set of founders that raised money, you know, have been in the ecosystem now for about 10 plus years. Um, and, you know, those of us in that sort of peer group are putting money back into the ecosystem and are supporting, you know, younger founders and teaching them resilience. I've also sort of come from a corporate background and I know how things go wrong. I, I sort of worked under regulation for a very long time. So yeah, so there's that first challenge of sort of just the natural number of problems you have on a, on a consistent basis, right? And, and I can speak to this because I've, I've lived around the world. So I know what it's like to sort of live in Nigeria and not live in, in, in Nigeria. And, and the second thing I say is that, is, is that Africa will disrobe a dodgy business model very quickly. Like, like there are some, <laughs> there are some business models that, that I, I, you know, <laughs> I just enjoy <laughs> looking at because they're just propped up by very generous regulations. <laughs> you know, and, and that doesn't exist, you know, uh, around these parts. So, so like I, 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 when I'm at a demo day and I'm judging and I see a poor founder get up and say they want to do an Uber for X, hmm. uh, you know, I, I usually ask, okay, so once you've made the connection, what stops me from getting this makeup artist number and completely disenfranchising, you know, your platform? You know, and, and at one point, a founder answered me and said, loyalty points. And I'm like, okay, you, you clearly, who do you know that has and keeps loyalty points on the continent? You know, but I, I, I was in Silicon Valley at one point, and I watched a very interesting exchange between some app that's like an Uber for photographers and somebody that obviously needed a photographer. And the photographer would not give up his phone number. And, and he sort of said, well, the law and I might get mystery shop. This went on for 20 minutes. And, and, and I swear, this was the most entertaining thing, you know, that I've seen in a really long time. And I just thought like two minutes in Nigeria, this thing would have like completely collapsed. And I've been in many other countries, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but, but this, number. Do you want my number? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, really, it's, not even a, it's not even a difficult conversation. Like, so, so I think that, you know, even subscription models, they get challenged here all the time, right? Like, like, I, I have had to have long discussions with consumers about paying for Netflix. So, so it's because they'll question the model and they'll be like, you expect me to pay when I'm not watching TV and you expect me to pay in the hope that you will release something that I like. Let's explore a different, uh, you know, possibility for payment here. And I say this because I've tried to sell content before, right, locally. And a monthly subscription was, it did not get any uptake. So you have to chop that up to like weekly, weekend, daily, half day, hourly, right? So that um, the proposition, the exchange of value is very clear to the customer. So another yeah. thing, um, you know, speaking to something that, that Yelly said is we're used to um, quick responses from our products. But, but in addition to being bred to do that, right? Products around here look like that because it's a low trust environment. The quickest way to build trust is to, to give me the quickest response to my value proposition. Mm -hmm. So you need mm -hmm. to cut down the time between me giving you money and me getting my value to as yeah. little as possible. So that's yeah. happening here, but I, I see that traveling off the continent eventually. You know, so I think, you know, the, the two preceding, you know, points I've made are the types of, I guess, sentiments. Those are the things in the air that make our products look the way they do, that make our consumers consume the way they do, um, in my opinion. So I, I, don't, I don't take a lot for granted around here, you know, and I definitely enjoy um, a local consumer because they will poke holes in your business model very, very, very quickly and to your own benefit. Yeah, so there's a couple of things I just want to I want to highlight in what you just said, Adia. One is, you know, we have a particularly defined notion of hustle here in Silicon Valley, and the notion of this in other parts of the world, Nigeria, India, you know, other places is very different, right? It's you looking out for your own, you figuring out if there's a way you can get a connection and get a network going. You're going to build your own network. You want to control your own business. You want to control your own brand. There's a the, the, it, I, I call it this almost this crypto native sensibility really already exists in many parts of the world. So we talk some times on the show about how we're seeing this transformation you know, in the United States towards this concept that we should have more control over things like our data or whatever. In many parts of the world, this is not a very big leap, right? It's a very easy 
thing if it doesn't already exist. So it's just important to kind of keep that in mind. It was one theme of the show. I think it's worth really trying to spotlight and point out how these things are very different in different parts of the world. The other thing I just want to note again, we've mentioned a couple of times is, you know, Nigeria is its own market to a large extent. There is, it is a massive population. Um, I think it's been like one fifth of sub-Saharan Africans live in Nigeria or Nigerian living in Nigeria. And so the idea that this is kind of fringe in some way uh, is crazy. It's probably, it's, it's actually quite racist because this is its own market, the way that China or India are their own markets. And it's important to really keep that in mind when we talk about some of these models here. So thank you both for that, that the framing. It's, it's really interesting and helpful. Well, well, it's interesting you brought up the point about data ownership. That, that's a really, you know, that, that I, I get triggered by that point quite often, right? Because I feel like one can't make that point with the same context in developing countries and developed countries. Yep. Right. Because um, in countries that have no infrastructure and few offline options, if you talk about, you know, uh, fully arming consumers to make decisions about their data, you run into the risk of delaying, further delaying the presence of infrastructure. Yeah. I think we, we need to make sure that we are contextualizing these conversations because there are some people that will not receive credit if um, a switch or a telecom company or a bank does not release their data, even in bulk, right? We don't even need you know, individualized data at this point, even if that data is not available to, if that data is not available to machine learning models, there's a whole bunch of products that just won't even exist. So, so I, I just had to jump in and, you know. But I, but I had to think about this though, like, so for instance, today, I just used a new product um, and I was about to sign up. And so I looked at the interface and I saw it was asking for my banking information right and i'm like hmm i'm not sure i trust this because again i think like there's definitely that spectrum wherein the more um digitally aware mm -hmm. someone is the more skeptical they are of mm -hmm. like digital tools but mm -hmm. on the kind of like mass market spectrum they care more about the value that that data gives them than the ownership of the data itself. Mm -hmm. So if you were to put it on a kind of like a graph, you have this kind of like overlapping, um, mm -hmm. you know, X, right? So mm -hmm. for me, I think a lot about like, what am I, like the value you're giving me, is that more valuable than the data? And for the most part, the answer will be no. But mm -hmm. in, the, in the context of something like credit, Wherein, mm -hmm. you know, the alternative is to is to is to go into a bank, wait for four hours. They ask you for a number of documents. They tell you to come back in two weeks to bring more documents to go beg a manager, and you still get no. Versus giving some credits or you know your your airtime history mm -hmm. for you to get a loan instantly that you can use to go pay for like critical bills. You know the 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 value data exchange is magnitudes different. So I think like that's like additional context that I wanted to add on top of, you know, your, your point in terms of how to think about like data ownership, you know, and, and, and I guess trust in, yeah. in, in, in Nigeria. It, it's, it speaks to, to Adia's point as well about this, this, where is the immediate value proposition, right? And, and, and yeah. perhaps that, that trade-off emerges yeah. because you're like, okay, I need credit. You got it or not, right? That's it. Deliver now. And and, and I was thinking about that when she was speaking uh, in terms of the, the the remittances story. That you know, as you said, is one of the buckets in which we're seeing interest in in crypto ELA um, in in Nigeria. But for a long time, and you're right, it was the big conversation we had about the developing world and this use case. But the but the one thing that everybody always pointed to as being the challenge was the on and off ramps that you've referred to the the fact that you've got to move in and out of crypto into local currency, and then of course the volatility of the currency uh, in the middle mm. of that being being a challenge. I'm wondering whether though uh, now that Bitcoin itself or any other uh, crypto as well has sort of risen in value and is now a, a more widely accepted at least store of value, if not you know a payment vehicle, whether that has it impacted concerns about that volatility? Like, is it now, do, do people feel as if like receiving Bitcoin as, as a mechanism for remittance 
um, is, is, is an easier and more valid thing to do now uh, than it yeah. was? Or is there still this concern about the exchange rate and what happens to it? So I think like from kind of like the data points I have, um, digital dollars, stable coins, whether that is BUSD, USDT or USDC, um, probably outweighs um, Bitcoin mm -hmm. um, in terms of remittances, especially from formal channels. Um, and it really comes down to those two things you mentioned. So one is about like volatility. Um, and especially now that, you know, most of these markets are driven by peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. So the worry is when you send sort of X amount of Bitcoin to someone, by the time it gets the recipient and you're changing, you know, the price has moved and things like that. So, mm. you know, what we're actually seeing is that digital dollars has become a lot more, um, um, the utility has increased a lot over the last over the last kind of like you know couple of months, um, because with, 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 with Bitcoin, since it's, it's you know the value is moving, you don't really have as much liquidity in the peer to peer markets compared to something like uh, um, you know let's say USDT or, and I think that was, was on, on that interesting point. So for a long time, I wasn't really a fan of USDT. Just because I came into crypto, I you know, heard the, all the various stories right. about USDT and the tether. And so yeah. for me, it was you know it was it was it was literally BUSD or USDC. Mm -hmm. But one thing is clear: locally, no one cares. Mm. I've like no one. I never hear anyone talk about you know tether or anything like that. And, and I think like another second point is also around fees, right? So in you know. In the US, more developed markets, when the cost of moving, you know, something on, on, on Ethereum is $20 or $40 or $50, no one thinks about this as a big deal. But when you realize that the average digital transaction is less than, you know, $5 or $10, then $20, $50 sounds obscene. Like you're paying five, 10 times more than what the actual value is. So what we're seeing is people are, you know, using things like, like TRC20 because the fees are extremely low. And, you know, there's, there's, there's something I'm working on. There's this kind of like, uh, is, a, is, a, is a paper. And I think it would really give a lot of people outside of emerging markets a lot of context into how people here view crypto and blockchain, wherein the utility is actually put in front of decentralization, which is super, super interesting because the vast majority of people in the West, the first lens through which you view crypto is decentralization. Like that's why we call our apps decentralized applications and apps. So it's like decentralization first. But in Africa and, you know, in my own experience dealing with our users is actually utility first. Right, utility first, user experience first. This idea of composability that I can move my crypto asset from bundle to buy coins to Binance and move it cheaply and quickly is more important than the idea of of of, of decentralization, which I think are you know interesting, you know, alternative viewpoints to view um, crypto in general. Thanks, uh, Adia. Um we have a reporter at, at Coindesk, uh, Sundali Handagama, who's written quite a number of articles about Nigeria, and they're always fascinating to me. And she wrote one a little while ago um, about how, you know, so part of what Yele was talking about, the growing demand for stable coins. And an element of what she did was to look at how these, uh, that, that technology is feeding itself into some of the traditional savings groups and other, you know, I suppose, long-standing innovations that almost precede the digital world that have existed in, uh, in, in, in really right across the African content. So savings groups, for example, um, I think they're called Asusu. Is that right? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. how, can you talk, do you know anything about that? Can you talk a little bit about how some of those traditional forms of financial innovation uh, are, are now intersecting in any way with, you know, stable coins and other digital solutions? 
So I, I haven't seen any intersections yet at all. So zero at the moment. But I'm going to pass back to Yele to see if he has. Yeah, so I think that's the it's, it's an interesting point. Um, you know, currently there was a there, there was a company in Kenya that sort of did some interesting things with 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 the idea of intersecting the saving circles with crypto. Um, unfortunately, they weren't they weren't as successful, um, and I kind of put that down to you when you have a system that is so ingrained into how people work it's not just enough for you to change the medium of exchange because that doesn't create as much value for it number one number two is that medium is still something so usually native young africans don't really do esusu mm-hmm. they use platforms like carrywise and piggy vest where you have a digital piggy bank that forces you to save because you can't withdraw your money for the next four, only, only four times in a year. And they give you some kind of interest in it. So some of the things that we're thinking about at Bundle, and I'm, and I'm going to share this, share this publicly. So maybe someone might even build this before us, but whatever. Nice. Some beauty. Is, <laughs> is, <laughs> we're really rethinking kind of like the idea of savings and, 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 and credit using crypto. I think this is where crypto is, extremely powerful so if you were using you know these traditional apps um you have like tbo rates which at one point was even negative you know with with sort of like DeFi protocols you can earn anything from you know six 12 percent dollar based returns and even ave today announced something i think it was 36 percent or something that is incredible you know, this idea of, 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 of being able to lend and earn very significant dollar-based returns that are even higher than what you'll have gotten on Naira is a really big one. Plus the fact that you can also kind of like lend, you know, your, 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 um, you can, you can, you can borrow your, your, your crypto and then get stable coins in return. Right. So we're, we're doing some interesting things around the intersection of like saving circles, wherein you're all kind of like saving together. And because you know each other and you're trusted, if you want to take out a loan, you could loan from a particular group of people, but you only loaned 50% of the amount, sort of 100% of the amount. And then the remaining 50% is constantly earning yield, right? So that ends that, that intersection of those three products creates something that is completely new, um, but is uniquely innovative for a digital millennial, um, um, you know, African on the continent. I mean, so to, I, uh, go ahead. To, to latch on to that point, I've, I've got my fingers crossed for one country in the global south um, with a smart central bank that can actually align um, a central bank issued coin with some of its economic imperatives, right? And then maybe do one pilot in one vertical, you know, with one set of incentives or one segment and see. I think then and only then will you see stable coins filter into Asusu. Um, and I, I mean, I don't know, because like Yele said, I mean, there's some really, really compelling um, crypto companies now, but I don't know that anybody um, has crossed 10 million users or how many have crossed one. Maybe there are a couple that have crossed 1 million users. So to, to sort of get to the level of application that you're talking about, Michael, you need scale. Um, and I think a smart central bank can very quickly achieve scale with a well-designed uh, coin. Um, I'm just putting that out onto, into the universe here. So you, Michael and Sheila, you're my channel to God here. <laughs> <laughs> we live to serve. Yeah, we're not quite that well connected. But. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, I take your point, right? And something I've been saying, I think both of us have been saying for a very long time is that this is an ecosystem and there is a role for each of these different actors in an ecosystem. And so I, I do see the role for leadership by a central bank in this space uh, to help shape uh, very dramatically what will happen here. I also think it's fascinating to me, and I've, I, something else I've been saying for a while is that I do think the global South writ large is really the breeding ground for, for DeFi. 
And you're going to see, I think, right, you're going to see pickup on DeFi as a concept really in the global south. I think far more than you're going to see. I mean, yes, it's fun to swap and this and that, you know, all that kind of thing. It's all very, um, it's all very entertaining, especially during a pandemic. But I think when you where you really see takeoff is going to be in the global south. And I think specifically, I have my eye on sub-Saharan Africa as a general market. And of course, Nigeria as the leader, I think, in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of being the readiness for innovation, the what I call, again, crypto nativity, right? That transition to crypto nativity, from digital nativity, I think is going to be really powerful. So uh, looking forward to seeing what's going to happen there. But one thing I want to I want to shift to a little bit, because uh, especially because we're nearing time, is is talking about activism as a general matter. And so in our, in our last episode, or I guess let me pause, on a previous episode of the show, we talked uh, with Alex Gladstein and with Sudan Hodel, with Mo, about activism. And so specifically in Sudan and how uh, Bitcoin specifically was kind of a means uh, for value transfer to activists who were sort of uh, working within regimes. But at the same time, it was also being used by those regimes themselves, you know, as a means of avoiding uh, sort of sanctions and things that had, that had happened around them. I'm curious the role that crypto plays for activism in Nigeria uh, and within communities that you've seen? And is that something that you think about and you tie together? Or do you feel like uh, the activism, there isn't necessarily the same understanding in the activist community about the value of crypto necessarily? I'm just curious to get your thoughts generally on that topic. Um, so Adia went first in the last hard question. So maybe I'll... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think this might sound like a disappointment to many. Um, but I'm not sure there is as close a link between crypto and activism in Nigeria, right? So yes, we had this um, um, sort of moment in in October twenty October twenty twenty during 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 the NSAS um, 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 sort of campaigns where crypto was used. Um, as as one of the channels um, for for allowing sort of diaspora to 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 get involved in 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 sort of um, supporting these 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 campaigns and protests, um, but I think like that was more or less the effect of the fact that crypto was be was being used for various of various other forms of remittances, right? Um, so. You know, maybe sometime down the line there might be, you know, um, a, a, a deeper connection. But you know, if someone looked at the total amount of money that was raised, you know, during, for instance, NSAS, and how much was raised in crypto, like the you know the numbers are considerably large on the on the on the on the cash, whether naira or like dollar or like other currency side of things. Um, but you know, I do I do think that. Crypto does play a role in giving individuals sovereignty um, and giving people freedom, not just in terms of financial freedom, but in terms of of of, of being able to coordinate um, and 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 act towards shared ideals in ways that wasn't really possible before. Um, and you know, I think over the next five, ten years, we would begin to see really really interesting and 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 creative applications um i i personally believe that the my biggest takeaway from 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 kind of you know nsars was as young nigerians we have to think very differently you know there was this video i watched of a um probably like a 40 year old nigerian you know he was talking about like when they were our age some of the riots and campaigns that they did. And I was quite surprised because the sentiment from our generation was like, how come our parents never did or tried to do some of the things that, that we're doing today? And you see how many people were on the streets, how people were rioting across, you know, um, you know pr protesting against injustices. And you're like, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have mobile phones, and they were able to coordinate to those numbers, right? So they tried, tried a particular method that wasn't successful. We, without knowing the history, did the same methods again, very unsuccessful. And the time now, remember what I said earlier, you know, 
because the new is unthinkable, we fight over the old, right? The way to displace, you know, incumbent systems is not trying to fight it. You have to create new systems that make the old ones obsolete. Mm -hmm. And so that is the mindset and the lens through which I think about every single thing I'm doing right now. You know, there was this tweet I, I, I chilled a while back. I said my, my mission was to help young Africans exit broken financial and governance systems. And it got so many retweets and likes. And so I was like, oh, well, people are thinking about this. And I read it under the comments and everything is about emigration to Canada or like some European country. And I'm like, guys, that's the one I was talking about. I was not talking, <laughs> I wasn't talking about, you know, emigration in that, in that sense, but I was talking about building sovereign digital states, right? You know, digital networks wherein we are in control of our own money. We pull our resources together as a community and we can effect changes in, you know, in the ways that you would never be able to coordinate yourselves without crypto or like blockchains, right? Um, but the bottom line is the problem and the need was felt. It was just that the lens to which they viewed the solution was still looking at things from the past. Whilst we're trying to think forward and say, how do we build these new systems that the old can't even think about competing with? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, and before there was October 20th, there was June 12th in Nigeria. Mm. So that, that was another sort of um, massive bloody day of protest in the fight for uh, democracy and, and what young people want. Um, and I will say that um, I'm surprised that Yele has uh, and I are on the same side of this uh, argument. <laughs> I consider myself a senior millennial. So when, <laughs> when I was engaging with my senior millennials, many of them didn't have Bitcoin wallets and they were wondering how they could get money because we are the ones, we have more spending power than our younger counterparts, right? So, yeah. so when you're talking about moving real money, it becomes a bit of a challenge because these are people that aren't really thinking about crypto. So I probably introduced 20, 25 friends, you know, to like bundle to go get a crypto wallet, right? <laughs> Just so that they could participate. And these people were often in the diaspora, right? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I would agree with Yeli. I don't think there is as strong a link as um, the number of digital natives involved in this call would lead you to, in, in the protest would lead you to believe. Um, you know, mm. wh whether that goes into the future, I don't know. So I mean, this, so many thoughts on this and, and unfortunately we're going to have to wrap in a moment, but I, I just thought like it was actually a really interesting note to, to leave off on because, you know, the narrative and, and, and Yella, you said maybe this is a disappointment when you started talking about that activism thing. And it reminded me that in many respects, you know, the way we talk about these things from the perspective of somebody here in the United States is I've got my convenient narrative that I'm looking for, right? I, li I like the, the activism story is a good one to tell. And I, I believe that it is a, there is a huge role for crypto and, and activism. But we then, we want to sort of tell ourselves certain stories. And so you guys have like, what you've done though, which has been really, really important here is you've, you've brought to us the nuance of what the reality is, right? Um, mm. that, that, yeah, maybe there's not, you know, we have this, this vision of Africa with its saving circles and maybe that's this, you know, no, that's not happening. And, and maybe, you know, activism isn't happening. However, the idea of, of Nigeria and other parts of the continent being a breeding ground for DeFi is fascinating. It's absolutely yeah. fascinating. And, and the idea that you guys are building, and as you put it, you know, an anti-fragile solution that you, you have to build an alternative, not attack the old. That, that's the framing that I find really, really interesting here. So thank you both so much. This has been really, really interesting, uh, eye-opening. Yes. I've loved every minute of it. Um, we'll have to have you back. I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I just, unfortunately, time is running out. So uh, Adia Soho, uh, Yeli Badamosi, and of course, my co-host, Sheila Warren, thank you so much. Uh, an excellent show. Uh, everybody, come back again next week for another episode of Money Reimagined. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.